Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our seminar series co-hosted by the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies at UC San Diego and the UCLA Center for the Study of International Migration. My name is Clara Dita. I am co-director of CCIS along with David Fitzgerald. And today we have the pleasure of hosting a discussion of Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success, co-authored by Leah Bustan here with us and Ron Abraminsky. Uh, a quick programming note first, we're gonna be taking next Friday off for the holiday weekend, but then we'll be back on Friday, June 2nd for a discussion of the migration development regime, how class shapes Indian emigration with author Rina Agarwala, Associate Professor of Sociology at the Johns Hopkins University and discussant Rohan Advani, who's a PhD student in sociology at UCLA. But in today's discussion, we're so lucky to host Leah Bustan, who's Professor of Economics at Princeton University. Uh, professor Bustan's work helps us understand the labor effects of immigration and the process of immigrant assimilation in the United States. And among her many contributions is the introduction and popularization of linking census data to uncover a richer, more complete picture of immigrant cultural assimilation in the US over time. Uh, our discussant is Claude Fisher, who's Distinguished Professor of Sociology at UC Berkeley. Uh, here's how we're gonna proceed. So Leah is gonna give about a 25 minute overview of her book. After that, Claude will give a 10 minute comment. Uh, Leah will have a chance to respond briefly, and then we'll open things up for Q&A and an open discussion. And at that time, you should feel free to raise your hand electronically, uh, and we can unmute you and you can ask a question live, or if you prefer, you can also just um, type in the question uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or the chat function, sorry, at the bottom of your screen, and I can pose the question to the author. All right, so Professor Bustan, welcome, and please tell us about Streets of Gold. Thank you so much for that introduction, Claire. And I am so honored to be here with such a distinguished group of scholars um, who study migration. I'm really looking forward to hearing your responses and reaction to the book. Um, this book was really 15 years in the making. Um, Ron and I have been collaborating on topics related to the age of mass migration from Europe to the US um, and working on building linked historical census data for um, around that time, starting when I was a faculty member at UCLA in the economics department. Um, we were then inspired to write a book that reached out to the public because we felt like our national conversation about immigration policy is too heavily focused on anecdotes and myths rather than data and facts, which is probably a frustration that um, is commonly shared by the different scholars on this call. One of these myths is what inspired our title, uh, the idea of streets of gold, namely that anyone can move to the United States from anywhere in the world with just a few dollars in their pocket um, and they can move up the ladder here. But the reality um, may be uh, far more complex and in fact could be reflected by this quotation that if you've gone to the Ellis Island Museum and all of you probably know this quotation well, it's, it's sort of a, a famous um, touchstone in immigration history uh, and is attributed to an unnamed Italian immigrant um, who came to the US um, circa 1900 and said, I came to America because I heard the streets were paved with gold. But when I got here, I found out three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, they weren't paved at all. And third, I was expected to pave them. And so what we wondered is what would out the history of immigration to the US look like if we rebuilt this story from the ground up using data on millions of such immigrant families, immigrant families that are unnamed uh, to the historical record so far um, in the sense that they don't reflect the outliers. Uh, They're not um, the immigrant CEOs or scientists or inventors who make it to the front page of the newspaper because of great contributions, and neither are they uh, the immigrant criminals or terrorists who might make it to the newspaper 
these days. Um, but instead, they are um, families um, that are engaged in work in many uh, different walks of life. And we thought we could rebuild um, the story of immigrant assimilation and perhaps immigrant success. Um, to do so, we use two main data sources. One is the modern data that we use for comparison between past and present, um, which I will describe in a few minutes. Um, but our historical data, like Claire alluded to, comes from linked historical census data. Um, to start with, the individual uh, census manuscripts uh, for the US um, were in manuscript form, but then were digitized and created into data sets primarily by volunteers from the Church of Latter-day Saints, from the Mormon Church. And they're available to the public um, through subscription genealogy services like Ancestry.com. Um, and that is, in fact, where Ron and I started um, poking around when I was at UCLA. And we set up two accounts and we just started um, by hand looking up individual families and we put together a few hundred. And then we thought, well, okay, well, let's be a little bit greedy and um, maybe scrape the data from the website. So we set up a bot that would ping ancestry.com every few seconds um, and pull down data on individuals. Eventually, Ron got a cease and desist call from the Ancestry lawyers um, at his office at Stanford. Um, and so when they found out that we were academics and we were not trying to create a competitor genealogy site, they allowed us to finish our project. But all, even more so, they, um, with our case, as well as the case of a few other groups of economic historians and historical demographers, realized that researchers were interested in this data and they um, have built research partnerships. So what we add here is, um, like Claire mentioned, uh, various approaches and algorithms to link individuals over time. Um, assimilation is an overtime concept, so we want to follow immigrants upon uh, recent arrival as they spend more time in the US, and then ideally also follow their children into the second generation. So the underlying manuscripts look like this one here, and then um, they have been digitized uh, before we even touched the data. Um, but I'm showing you this one uh, manuscript, not at all at random. This is my great grandfather, Hyman Platt, um, living in Chicago in 1920. Um, with his wife and his eight children. Um, if you scroll over on the page, you'll see the occupation of um, Hyman as well as a number of his kids. You can see that um, George and Rose and so on are in their 20s or their teens. And so um, these kids are already in the labor force and you'd see their occupation there. Um, our main economic uh, outcome for our historical data is something that we call an income score, but it's basically taking occupation, age, um, place of residence, and, and country or state of birth, um, and um, assigning an income to that individual. Um, we use the 1940 census, which is the first census that has both income and all of those other attributes, uh, to generate a statistical model that tells us, you know, if you're a carpenter living in Mercer County, New Jersey in 1940 um, of a certain age and so on, um, what your likely, you know, income would be. And we assign that back in time. And I'm bringing my, uh, my own family to bear here because it turns out that my great grandfather, Hyman, um, never moved up the occupational ladder or the income score ladder um, from his arrival in the US um, in the um, uh, circa 1890 and then forward um, to when we pick him up here in 1920. Um, so he moved, um, uh, did not move up according to our measure. Um, very much, and that's very consistent with what we see um, in the first generation, um, both historically and today. So the first generation, the immigrants themselves, um, start out with earnings gaps relative to the US born, and they close those gaps to some extent, but they do not achieve complete convergence in the first generation. Um, it is the second generation, the children of immigrants, that do catch up to the children of the US born, um, both historically and today. So our book is organized essentially as a myth-busting exercise. Um, we reassess um, uh, four main uh, immigration myths, um, and um, we find that um, that each of these myths is not consistent with the data in, in new and interesting ways. 
So um, what I'm going to um, talk about today is really just a few of these um, uh, in, in our short time together. But essentially, we, we start with um, a myth that I think for all of us is um, quite, quite obviously not true, but um, is something that the public really doesn't know. Um, so there's a sense these days that there, we're living through an unprecedented flood of immigration. Um, and of course, this is not true. Um, if you look at the share of the US population that's foreign born, it's very similar today than it was um, during the Ellis Island generation 100 years ago. Um, then we look at the first generation. And I think we have a a nostalgic view that is um, perhaps uh, formulated in um, high school history classes. Um, it may be passed down in family stories as well that uh, somehow the Ellis Island immigrants rose quickly from rags to riches, but that immigrants today are not as successful. Um, and what we see is that in terms of the pace of upward mobility, um, these two time periods are remarkably similar. What's different is that the um, the Ellis Island immigrants arrived from European sending countries. Many of these countries, though not all, were poorer than the US, um, but the gaps in GDP per capita between the US and sending countries today are much larger. And so immigrants are starting um, out with earnings gaps that are larger today. Um, so they're achieving the same pace of upward mobility, but that does mean that the gaps take longer to close. So that leads to some concern that not only immigrant families, but also their children will be stuck in a permanent underclass. Um, and I will show you um, uh, some evidence on this uh, in our call today, you know, just in a few minutes. And I think that this is really the core of the book, um, which is that we, we can show that the pace of upward mobility for the children of immigrants today um, is very similar to the Ellis Island period, even when um, we're looking at poor families and even when uh, parents are coming from poor sending countries. Um, and then though we're economists, we also do venture into looking at cultural assimilation. Um, and I think it's really a very widespread view um, that immigrants today do not try to become American as rapidly as immigrants in the past. Um, and, and some people have a negative frame on this. Other people say, well, this is positive. It's because we live in a more multicultural society. Um, but on all of the measures that we, that we can um, compare with past and present, learning English, um, who do immigrants marry, what neighborhoods are they living in, um, and the names that immigrants give to their kids as they spend more time in the country, we actually see remarkably similar pace of cultural assimilation or efforts to adopt American behaviors today. Um, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, though, honestly, on this call, I'm sure we all are, um, I'm, to start with myth one, um, it's, it's clear when we graph out the share of the U.S. population that's foreign born starting in 1850, which is the first census that asks this question, um, and going forward to today, that, of course, today we're at a local high point um, starting in 1970 and going forward to 2020, um, the share of foreign born has been rising, uh, reaching around 14% recently, um, but no higher um, than um, 100 years ago. And we've only recently just reached that peak. Um, in fact, during um, the age of mass migration, uh, the share foreign born was at 14 or 15 percent for 50 years. And of course, the um, immigration U in the middle um, with the low point at around four or five percent share foreign born in 1970 um, is not really driven by underlying economic factors that made the U.S. somehow um, not a destination of choice, but instead is really policy driven with the um, closure of the border in 1921 and 24, um, and then um, a constrained reopening in 1965. Um, and again, everyone here is, is presumably familiar with um, the, the very uh, large differences in um, the regional backgrounds of immigrants uh, over these two time periods. So if we look at the two local peaks, um, one around 1900 and one around 2020, um, we, we see that the share foreign born is the same, but the composition of migrants is really quite different. Um, the yellow um, region here is reflecting immigrants leaving Europe to the US. The red region is immigrants leaving other countries in the Americas and the blue region is Asia. And so today immigrants are coming from a much more diverse set of sending countries and also a poorer set of sending countries as well um, as reflected by um, the ratio of GDP per capita between the US and its largest sending partners. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to jump to um, myth three about the second generation, um, and I'll show you what happens to the children of immigrants um, relative to the children of the US born. It's interesting to look at this question overall. So um, just compare all kids, all children of immigrants to all children of US born to look at um, absolute mobility patterns. Children of immigrants have further to travel because on average they're being raised in poorer households. And what we see when we look at that pattern is that children of immigrants do experience near complete convergence with children of US born. But what I'll show you today is um, going to be uh, a slightly different concept. We're going to be looking at children who are raised in households with similar incomes. Um, and so given that children of immigrants start out in poorer households and end up converging, what that this is going to imply is that if we look at households that start out with similar resources, children of immigrants are going to experience um, higher rates of social mobility. And that is indeed what we find. So I'll focus today on um, kids who are all being raised at the 25th percentile of the income distribution. Um, so roughly two parents working full time at minimum wage jobs would put you at the 25th percentile. And uh, for the past, I'll use the linked census data. So we've already talked about that. You could see in the case of my grandfather um, living with my great grandfather that um, if we pick up one childhood observation, let's say in 1910 or 20, um, we can observe the childhood household characteristics. And then we need to link that individual forward uh, to 1940 um, to pick up uh, the child when he enters the labor market. And I say he because um, uh, for our historical data, um, at the moment, we're only able to link sons. Um, though there's substantial progress going on right now um, with a grad student of mine and a research assistant of mine, and they have a new paper on um, uh, approaches that we can use to link women. Uh, for the modern data, I haven't described where that comes from yet, so I'll just mention that this um, data comes to us um, uh, with thanks to um, the Opportunity Insights Lab at Harvard. Um, and they have a partnership with um, the IRS. And so underlying this data are individual tax records. And if you file taxes with your own social security number, you also will write down the social security number of all of your kids as your tax dependents. Um, and that way we're able to, um, or they, I should say, are able to link a parent to a child. And when the child him or herself enters the labor force, um, they will then file taxes under their own social security number. We do not have that micro data. Um, that is really under lock and key. And instead, we were provided with some aggregate data um, for families of the 25th percentile by country of origin of the parents. So I'm going to turn to that now. Um, now remember, these are all kids raised at the 25th percentile, and our x-axis here ranges from 45 to 65. So everyone is moving up on average relative uh, to their parents. Um, but uh, what we really emphasize here is the magenta dot, which reflects the children or the sons, I should say, um, of white US born parents relative to the peach dots, which are almost entirely to the right of the magenta dot, reflecting higher rates of upward mobility um, for um, the children of uh, immigrants who come from many other uh, parts of the world. Um, and so this um, uh, image includes uh, children of immigrants from um, poor Central American countries that are very much in the news today, um, including Guatemala here, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. Um, and so uh, despite the fact that there are some fears that immigrants from Central America who come across the border um, uh, have few skills and are working at low paid jobs uh, and may not contribute much to the economy as a result, we can see that even though um, it, some of these immigrants are at the 25th percentile and are raising kids um, in relatively poor households, uh, the children are able to rise. Um, there is a one interesting um, outlier here uh, in terms of the sons of uh, immigrants from Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, and Jamaica, three majority Black Caribbean countries. And while I did not bring the comparable graph for daughters today, because we have a very short time together, um, if we look at the daughters of 
Caribbean families we, and compare them to the daughters of US born and, and other locations, we actually see that the daughters of Caribbean families are would be right around here at the two thirds point um, uh, among these set of dots. And so um, the relatively low upward mobility of um, sons of Caribbean families is not only a race story, but it's um, race interacted with gender. Um, What's special is that we also then can compare these findings to uh, historical cohorts. And just to focus in on uh, boys who are living at home in 1910, um, who were raised at the 25th percentile, we see a very similar pattern where um, the sons of white US born fathers are moving up, but they're moving up more slowly than the sons of immigrants from around uh, these various European countries, particularly countries that were pointed to by politicians at the time, like Italy, Ireland, Portugal, um, as countries um, that would never uh, be able to assimilate or contribute to the economy. Um, it, with the historical data, we have individual records, so we have a lot more scope for understanding mechanisms. And it turns out that the mobility advantage for the children of immigrants historically is almost entirely driven by geography. So what I'm going to show you on the next slide is comparing the raw gap in rank points for children raised at the 25th percentile. So we have U.S. born at 40, and on average, we have immigrant kids of immigrants at 46. So that's six rank points in an uncontrolled fashion. And then I'm just adding a few geographic controls. And so most importantly is the fact that immigrants did not move to the US South in large numbers. And the South was an area that was highly agricultural and cotton growing and not an area of high upper mobility, either for white or black Americans. And you see that just controlling for the South can explain half of this um, children of immigrant advantage. And then finally, over on the right hand side of the image, you see that controlling for whether you live in an urban or a rural area can explain the rest. And so the most important factor historically is that immigrant parents were more likely than US born parents to move to labor markets that offered upward mobility for everyone. And these were, um, as I've learned from work done at UCLA by Dylan Connor um, uh, and others, uh, these were areas that um, were intensive in manufacturing jobs. Um, and so those may have attracted immigrants to begin with and thinking about their own work life, but then also conferred advantage on their kids. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we look at um, cultural uh, assimilation outcomes as well, um, along a variety of dimensions, um, marriage, language skills, uh, neighborhood. But one measure that we particularly like is the uh, shift uh, in name choices that parents make as they spend more time in the country. This allows us to have multiple observations on a single immigrant as they spend more time in the US. Um, and what we see is that uh, there is a strong shift in names that immigrant parents choose for their kids as they spend more time in the US. And so I'm putting here the example of Kamala Harris, our vice president, and, and her sister Maya. Kamala was born of two immigrant parents, one from India, one from Jamaica, and has a very um, Hindi name, um, but her sister with, um, was born three years later and has a name that is, is sort of ethnically ambiguous and can be found in many different languages and cultures. And so we um, use census records to construct um, a whole household rosters in the past. And in the modern data, um, we were able to look at this with California birth certificate records um, that we were able to access uh, back when I was at UCLA. And we use the, the data to assign foreignness to each name basically by counting and finding out the relative probability of having a name um, if you're foreign born or US born. And we do find that immigrant moms um, give their names more uh, ethnically, give their children more ethnically sounding names on, on this metric, um, but that the gap between immigrant moms and US born moms close as immigrants spend more time in the country. And what's especially important is that it closes at the same pace um, in, in the past as today. Um, so let me close um, by uh, just uh, posing a question which we uh, sort of end the book with. Um, it's, Essentially, our book has a very optimistic cast to it. It seems like the American dream is just as real now as it was 100 years ago. Um, and then the question that we end the book with is, why, therefore, has it been so hard uh, to make progress on immigration reform?
And the short answer that we come to, but we're continuing to do more work on this, is um, is political polarization. Um, but we, we have a lot more to say about what is underlying this polarization. Um, and uh, of course, that's that's an easy answer. Um, but but we have have um, more thoughts about what's um, underlying uh, this recent change. So we do think that the optimistic news about um, immigrant success is getting through to the public. Um, if we look at um, public opinion polls like Gallup, 75% of respondents say that immigration is good for the country. So there does seem to be a silent majority um, in favor of immigration these days. Um, and we've also added um, a very long-term measure of public opinion um, by analyzing speeches in the congressional record. In order to do this, we had to classify speeches from 1880 until today as either immigration related or not. Um, and then among those set of speeches that are immigration related as either pro, neutral, or anti-immigration. And what we find is that the average speech about immigration in the congressional record, even today, is positive and has been positive um, since around 1955 uh, or 60. But what has changed um, is a growing polarization. And so I will end um, with this pattern. Um, so um, what I am showing you here is the share of speeches that are pro-immigration minus the share that are anti, keeping in mind that 40% of speeches throughout the time period are neutral. Um, and so if you have numbers like minus 40, that means that 10% of speeches are pro and 50% are anti. And that was true uniformly from 1880 to 1945. And it was true of both Democrats and Republicans. Um, it didn't get particularly worse before the border closed in 1921. And you do have to recall that Congress tried to close the border four times before they were successful. And in fact, um, Politicians like Senator Lodge, who I always thought of as being particularly an outlier um, in terms of his anti-immigrant sentiment, is actually spot on the mean. Um, so sentiments like immigrants are from the lowest and most illiterate classes, that was uh, a very common sentiment at the time. But we see between World War II ending um, and the border reopening in 1965, a really dramatic change in average sentiment towards immigration in just one generation. Um, and so uh, we are working more this uh, summer on trying to understand some of the underlying individual data that uh, give rise to these averages, um, but uh, um, the historical narrative um, seems to be that the Cold War played an important role in, um, in shifting at least elite attitudes towards immigration, um, with President Truman concerned that um, as World War II ended, the USSR started to um, hold up immigration policy as an anti-American propaganda message saying that the US had racist immigration policies given their country by country quota system. Um, President Truman wanted to change um, and sort of take away that talking point. And so he wanted to change the narrative on immigration from being one of an us versus them um, and immigrants as foreign and as um, in invaders to a certain extent to one in which immigrants were actually part of the American fabric. Um, and he really emphasized the roles of immigrants serving um, patriotically alongside the US born in World War II. Um, it seems like uh, at least from the time series, that um, this presidential effort was successful in changing the narrative. And then we see uh, the remainder of the series. Um, from 65, when the border reopens, we start to see polarization emerging between the parties and only widening over time. Uh, the gray line, which was underlying the blue and red averages, um, is the overall average um, including both Democrats and Republicans. And we see that that gray line remains positive today. So the average speech in Congress today about immigration is still positive. Um, so the message is getting through, uh, but what we need to understand is what's underlying this polarization. Um, so that is work that we're working on right now. Um, what we see is that in terms of classifying speeches by topic, um, Republican speeches these days um, are heavily focused on crime and legality. And Democratic speeches about immigration are heavily focused on contributions, family, and refugees or persecution. 
Um, and so these days, Ron and I have been working on um, long run time series on immigration and crime, which we can talk about in, in Q&A. So there's much more in the book, more than I was able to cover here. Um, we have some work on refugees um, that's joint with Peter, who's here on the call. Um, we have a chapter asking whether this immigrant success comes at the expense of the US born. Um, and, and usually um, the data and evidence suggests that it does not. And we also try as much as possible to incorporate stories of immigrant families, um, both from historical oral histories and from a, a modern survey that we fielded. So yes, we are economists, um, we are quants at heart, but we did really try to match up the quantitative patterns um, with the individual voices of immigrants immigrants and their, their children. So um, I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to share the work. Thank you so much, Leah, this wonderful uh, book and presentation. And now we'll turn it over to Professor Claude Fisher for a comment. Okay, now that I'm turned on, I want to thank uh, Roger and the Center for inviting me to give this talk, uh, this comments, uh, and for the opportunity to read this excellent book. And I've also looked at a couple of the AER papers behind the book. I recommend both the book and the papers. Uh, I also would say by way of pre uh, prefatory remarks that this book has some personal resonance for me. I was among the last wave, last cohort of immigrants to the United States to go through Ellis Island. Uh, and I have my family's name is carved on one of those monuments on Ellis Island. Now, to my comments about the book. Uh, I appreciate, first of all, I want to say what I appreciate the book for its contribution as a piece of public social science. I think it is vital for social scientists to translate our increasingly complicated research for the wider public, and this is a great example of doing that. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it could offer a, a model for many others to do. Um, while I admire the book, I see, uh, you know, my task here is to sort of raise some issues and, I, I, and some complexities. And so let me go on to do that. As I see, the goal of this book is to help reduce Americans' hostility toward today's immigrants and refugees. Now, the hostility is in some ways exaggerated by our political situation because Survey data shows that a majority of Americans support actually increasing immigration. So in some ways, it's not so much the general public, perhaps, but uh, the political system that needs education. In any event, the way the book tries to uh, uh, reduce hostility toward today's immigrants is in two ways. One, by casting doubt on the nostalgia that Americans have about immigrants of earlier periods. A nostalgia that says that the immigrants in the past contributed needed labor. They lifted themselves up by their bootstraps. They Americanized as soon as possible. And uh, uh, this book tells us that this story was not so heroic. And then the second way they try to assuage uh, the fears Americans have about today's immigrants is to look at today's immigrants. Uh, to address fears such as the idea that immigrants will take American jobs. Uh, that uh, immigrants uh, will stay on the margin, that immigrants will be on the dole, that immigrants won't become Americans. And the message of the book to the general reader is that immigration today is like immigration then. If we esteem and value the immigrants of the past, we should esteem and value the immigrants of today. That's my sort of capsule bumper sticker summary. So my comments address the issue of how persuasive this argument is, or those arguments are. On the first part, taking the halo off of the past story of immigration, uh, the authors show that the progress of the immigrant generation was quite slow. It was the second generation that advanced. And I would agree with them that the nostalgia we have exaggerates the success and assimilation of earlier immigrants. It also underestimates, and perhaps this is not discussed as much in the book, also underestimates the advantages that those earlier immigrants had. There's a very important book by a former colleague of mine, Stanley Lieberson, called A Piece of the Pie, which addresses the common complaint of an earlier generation that Blacks uh, were not succeeding, but Im European immigrants were succeeding. What was wrong with Black Americans that they were not succeeding when they moved to Northern cities into industrial sectors? 
Now, Lieberson does an extensive analysis of this question, but he focuses on a couple of key points. One being that Europeans did not face the level of discrimination that Blacks did. And critically, that the demographics of the two experiences differed. And this uh, points to some issues with regard to the current book. Lieberson argues that the ending of European immigration in the 1920s reduced the competition, labor competition, precisely for that second generation. So the children of the Ellis Island immigrants did not have to face yet new immigrants from those old countries. And in terms of the question of Blacks moving to the North, uh, Lieberson points out that Black migrants to the North continued to have to face more and more competition from other Black migrants going from the South to the North. Um, I should also mention a 2012 book by my colleague Sibel Fox called Three Worlds of Relief, in which she shows how social workers in the first half of the 20th century made special efforts to assist European immigrants, but not efforts to assist Blacks or Mexicans. Another paper, a recent paper that came out, a sociology paper, shows that earlier immigrants were also had the advantage of easier naturalization rules than we have today. And finally, a recent NBER paper points out that earlier immigrants were advantaged by competing to a great extent against young men who had been raised on farms rather than young men of skilled worker background. So these studies that I mentioned right now actually are consistent mostly with streets of gold. Earlier European immigrants struggled to advance, their kids advanced. Uh, and indeed, earlier immigrants were not that quick to assimilate. Uh, it was their kids who were quick to assimilate. Um, one, I'll just say, side note, one of the very few pieces of my own research has ever has gone viral was a graph showing that immigrants at the end of the 20th century were learning English faster than immigrants who arrived at the start of the 20th century, which is exactly the opposite of the stereotype one often encounters. Now, the other part of Leah's and Rand's analysis makes two claims concerning immigrants today. One, that they are progressing and assimilating as well as earlier waves did. And secondly, that these successes are not overall on balance at the expense of native born Americans. Now, I basically agree with these general arguments and have done so in print, but um, and I just want to raise a few concerns, uh, issues about that. Three in specific. How am I doing in terms of time? You're fine. Okay. So should Americans today be uneasy about today's immigration? Should they be reassured by streets of gold? So one issue in the analysis is the issue of selection effects. I think the authors are quite sensitive to this question, but I don't know that they have fully extended the analysis. There is evidence in their own work and in other work that today's immigrants are more positively selected than earlier waves were. Yes, they may come from poor countries, but the, the, the selection into the migration stream seems to be higher uh, than in earlier waves. And that may be precisely because the barriers to immigration are higher in 2010 than they were in 1910. So that is to say, another way to put it is a century ago, more immigrants were, to quote Lazarus, tempest-tossed, wretched refuse. While today's immigrants are more likely to be advantaged, say, by knowing English. Now, if this is true, the implications are then important. If today's immigrants are successful, not so much because the country can absorb them as well as it did a century ago, but by the fact that the migrants today have more personal advantages, what economists call human capital, uh, then the implication is that were the U.S. to significantly expand immigration, that selection advantage would be lost. And instead, we would see a higher rate of failures among the newcomers who are no longer so selected by the process. So that's concern number one, the selection effect. Have, have they underestimated the selection effect and the change between now and the past and the selection effect? A second concern, is the sample that the book uses for current immigrants the right sample? Is it current enough? If I understand correctly, and maybe I, I misunderstand, but if I understand correctly, the story of contemporary success 
focuses on children born to immigrant fathers around 1980 and claimed on those fathers' income tax returns in 1994. This means that we are basically talking about the immigrants and the children of immigrants who arrived in the country in the 1970s and 80s. But since the 1970s and 80s, first of all, the flow of immigration has increased greatly. This mix of immigration has shifted greatly from heavily from Mexico to East Asia, India, even Africa. Uh, the proportion undocumented has increased greatly. And even though the undocumented are hard to find, uh, and, and, and Lee and Rand do a great job of trying to find them in the GSS data, we have to confess that we under we underrepresent them in our studies and probably underrepresent the ones who are doing worst uh, are most underrepresented. So the point, the second point I'm making is if the modern story in Streets of Gold is the story of how immigrants of the 1970s and 80s raised children who are now relatively successful, does that really assuage the concerns of Americans about what our 21st century policy on immigration should be? And the third and last point I'll make is concerns whether immigrants economically undercut the native born. Uh, the authors largely focus on the success of the second generation and they, when they turn to the issue of competition. But what about the first generation? There's long been a debate about what the, the inflow of the first, the immigrants themselves of the first generation do to the labor pool. And again, I suspect this audience, and certainly Lee and Rand know the literature far better than I, uh, but the authors admit that there were, quote, some native-born winners and some losers in the short term from competition with the immigrants. And I <clears throat> saw a recent study of, of uh, earlier immigration that finds that low-skilled young native-born workers, low-skilled young native-born workers seem to be pushed out of the local labor market. It may be short term, but for low income native born Americans, the short term may be the only term they have. And then I add for your consideration the issue of competition that the second generation poses. And here this, we all know, is a hot topic around schools and colleges. And anybody at any of the UCs knows how much tension there is over the question of the competition that second generation Asian students pose for uh, second, for third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth generation native born American California students. So are the children of immigrants displacing the children of the native born in the competitive job uh, college market and the competitive job market? So these are the three issues that I would raise. Uh, again, I'm, I'm very happy to have read this book. It's very stimulating. I recommend it and I hope it gets very wide readership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claude. Uh, over to you, Leah, for a response. Thank you so much for that thoughtful comment on the book. Um, I uh, I want to start by by thanking you uh, for emphasizing the way in which this book is an act of public social science. We have really uh, been overwhelmed by the response to the book. So I, I just wanna mention um, that in addition to talking to academic audiences like this one, we've had the opportunity to talk to um, many local immigrant groups, as well as interestingly and unexpectedly from my perspective, um, various business and center right business oriented groups as well. Um, so for example, I went up to an immigrant incorporation fair that was being held at a mall in Patterson, New Jersey, got to talk a little bit about the book um, with simulcast into Spanish uh, for the audience and had people coming up afterwards and pointing out, hey, there's Ecuador on your chart. And I can see, you know, like, I'm so excited to see my country represented. So actually to interact with immigrants who were at the fair to seek public services and legal services, um, but also to, to talk to groups like Business Roundtable and Conference Board and, you know, groups that are very focused on, um, on um, innovation, on productivity, on employment. Um, so that has been um, really quite exciting for us. Uh, on to the um, the critiques, which are are very very well taken. Um, 
So um, I'm not gonna take them quite in order, just as they're written on my page. Is the sample current enough? This is really important. We are looking at kids who were born in the early 80s. And that is central for two reasons. One, like Claude was saying, um, uh, this is during a, a relatively early period in the new age of mass migration. Um, but also, families that arrived undocumented in the late 70s and early 80s had the opportunity, for the most part, to move on to a pathway to citizenship with the 1986 IRCA reform. And so we think we're capturing many families that started out as undocumented immigrants, but then had work permits, green card, and maybe even citizenship by the time we're picking up their income. Um, and so we think that in a way we see this cohort as telling us what could be if immigrants had um, legal advantages today, but we don't know um, that this is indeed what's going on today, and particularly for countries like Mexico and for some of the Central American countries that I pointed to. It could be that if we instead had um, a, a, a cohort born 10 years later, 1990 births, we would not see this to the extent of upward mobility that we see. The problem is that we need time for the kids to enter the labor market and get to the midpoint of their career. Um, I know all of us do not want to be judged based on how much we were earning when we were 23 or 24 years old, so we need time for the kids to get to their mid-30s. This is something we could do with GSS, for example, um, pretty soon, but those samples are small. Ideally, IRS will give us new extracts for kids born around 1990, but there are now some sample selection problems about undocumented households and whether indeed they would be in the IRS records. Um, so there are data challenges, but I think that this point is very, very important. Um, on the question about selection, um, would the advantage that immigrants experience today, especially children of immigrants, be lost if we significantly expanded immigration? The answer to this is we really don't know. We do not have that experiment um, to analyze. In um, We only have the country as it operates now, and that's an N of one. Um, and so when people have asked me again and again in discussing the book, if you had a magic wand, what would you do to immigration policy? Would you double immigration? Would you, would you expand to the number of entry slots? Um, and all I can say is that this is a very status quo oriented book. This is a book about defending the current status quo. And we have seen recent attempts to chip away at the status quo. The 2017 Raise Act, for example, which did not pass, but try to cut sl entry slots by 40% and shift towards a Canadian point system. What we're trying to say is we don't need a point system. Even if immigrants enter um, and take low paying jobs, especially because the labor market has some needs in those areas, um, whether it's home health care, whether it's child care, whether it's construction, etc., cetera, um, the children um, seem to uh, flourish. Um, but we, we certainly couldn't don't know what would happen if instead of 1 million entrants a year, at least through legal pathways, we had 4 million entrants a year. Would we start kind of pulling down, sort of moving down the, um, the skill ladder and um, having immigrants who are not as positively selected? That is, is very hard to say. Um, and so this is not really a utopian book. It, it's more of a let's defend the, the status quo and maybe on the margin um, we can make small increases. Uh, there are think tanks in DC who say to keep pace with current demographic trends, we might want to increase our slots from 1 million entrants a year, you know, some come in above the caps, for example, because they're uh, spouses of citizens and so on. So around 1 million legal entrants a year, maybe to 1.3. Um, and that sounds very sensible. Um, in terms of um, competition between immigrants and the US born, um, as we do emphasize in the book, um, there are uh, there are studies all over the map. Um, most of the studies in the U in, in um, economics looking at wages and employment find very small effects on the US born. Um, 
sometimes even positive effects on the US born. Um, so they're quite mixed, but there are some cases where people find evidence um, that there are winners and losers. But what's interesting, and I've started to think about more in talking about the book, is that's true on wages and employment. And we have maybe 300 studies on this, but we only have a few studies on housing prices. And as inflation got more into the news cycle over the past year, the role of immigrants in increasing local prices um, started to become more on my mind. And in fact, those studies connecting immigration and house price and rent increases using the same research designs as the wage or employment studies actually tend to find that when immigrants or anyone really, but immigrants are people that need houses and when immigrants move into an area, housing prices go up. I think that this actually may be more important in voters' attitudes towards immigrants than concerns about job loss. Think about inflation versus unemployment more broadly. Usually unemployment hits a few people, a very concentrated effect, and often those, um, those people are not necessarily um, um, powerful and with um, a large voice. And so sometimes their concerns don't get heard. Whereas inflation hits everyone um, and we hear from consumers. Uh, so I, I think we should do a bit more on thinking about how the interactions between immigration and housing. And finally, on second generation Asian students, I do want to plug a, a new paper of mine that um, just came out in, well, it's, it's available online in the Journal of Urban Economics. It's coming out as part of a special issue on race and social justice um, in the Journal of Urban Economics. And it's specifically looking at California school districts. What happens when Asian students move in to a California school district? And we find very strong white flight, but only in, um, upper income suburban districts. So it's precisely uh, the group that you might, might expect and perhaps in part because of concerns about being in the top 10% of the high school and, and parents might be strategic in terms of trying to get their kids into the UC. Um, but also, um, you know, anecdotally, we do hear uh, difference sort of maybe subtle differences, but differences in educational philosophy as well. Um, and so uh, at least in terms of, you know, voting with your feet, there does seem to be um, really a, a, a very notable um, response on the part of uh, white households in, in upper income suburbs concerned about competition with uh, Asian students. And so uh, we do see evidence of that in the data, um, as you're describing, Claude. Um, so it's important, and I hadn't really been thinking much about how competition is not only first generation, but also potentially second generation as well. Um, thank you. And looking forward to other, other questions that you all may have. I've had more opportunity to talk to the public about the book than to other academics. So I've had a little bit of interaction with other academics. So especially interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. Uh, this is fascinating. So uh, while I wait for folks to uh, uh, start typing in their questions in the chat or uh, uh, raise their hands, uh, I just wanted to say um, uh, that your insight on housing prices is really uh, important and in line with some of the political science research on um, violence against immigrants in Europe. Um, I'm thinking about your colleague uh, at Princeton, Rafaela Danziger, uh, who uh, who has has shown that that violence against immigrants is very much related to housing prices and competition over housing um, in in Britain. Um, so I, I think there's definitely uh, so, some useful insights here. Um, all right. Okay. Uh, first question from David. Hi. Thanks very much, Leah. I was really interested in the segment on the changing ways that immigration has talked about in Congress. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more about your methodology, as well as some, some more of the, the findings of the way the specific types of arguments that are made have changed over that, that time period. OK, thank you. Um, so this is a joint work that Ron and I did with uh, Dan Jarofsky, who is a linguist um, at Stanford and also members of Dan's lab. Um, and we do have a paper out on this um, in PNAS last year. Um, and so essentially what we're doing um, is we are classifying 
um, the 8 million speeches in the congressional record on two dimensions. First, are they immigration speeches or not? And secondly, if they are immigration speeches, are they pro, neutral, or anti? And so to find speeches that are immigration related, um, well, it is a needle in a haystack. Around 1% to 2% of speeches, as we um, have found, are immigration related. So we start with a set of very broad keywords. Um, and that produces um, a set of candidate speeches that might be immigration related, but many of them are actually about foreign policy or trade. Um, and then we had um, a set of research assistants, undergraduates here at Princeton, classifying paragraphs of speeches. They classified around 10,000 paragraphs um, as immigration related or not. And then if immigration related, we had them classify pro, neutral, or anti. Um, and so we had them code just those two things by hand. Um, and then we uh, used the Roberta model, which is in a way sort of similar to ChatGPT. Um, it's a large language model to scale up their classification scheme to the full congressional record. But we can also produce the time series just with the hand annotations instead, just to make sure um, that things aren't being driven by strange aspects of the model. Um, and that's how we put together the time series that I showed you. But of course, um, this comes from underlying data from individuals. Um, and so we, uh, this summer, are um, working with the attitude measures that we get at the individual representative level um, to try to understand what is it about either the personal attributes of the representative or the attributes of the local electorate that determine um, who's pro and who's anti-immigration. And what's particularly interesting are what are the factors that shift the average person to be pro-immigration from 45 to 65? And what are the factors that are underlying current polarization? Um, so we're going to be looking at the full time series, but also at those uh, two key moments as well. Um, and then finally, um, on the, um, the topics that I mentioned, um, we did classify the speeches into 14 different um, topics. Um, and we did that by um, picking out words that are more commonly used to modify um, as adjectives or um, as verbs um, to explain the actions of immigrants relative to other person words. So a person word would be like man or woman or student or teacher, um, or and an immigrant word would be immigrant or alien or you know, foreigner, that sort of thing. Um, and we pull out the words that are more commonly associated with immigrants relative to other persons. And then we classified those words. So there was the top thousand words, um, and we classified them both by hand and by k-means into these 14 different topics. And that was how we were able to learn that um, at least descriptively underlying the polarization that you see is actually not economic factors. We have two topic buckets that are related to economics. One we call labor and the other we call economics and economics relates to fiscal uh, issues, um, social welfare, taxes, that sort of thing. And actually, um, Democrats and Republicans are no more or less likely to talk about those topics. Um, instead, it's Republicans talking about crime and legal issues, and Democrats talking about what we call contributions, family, and persecution. Um, so that's been really driving our research agenda um, recently. Um, so we've been working on refugee issues with Peter. We've been working on crime issues as well. And in part thinking maybe we're in the wrong business here. You know, as economists, we've been so focused on, you know, labor and economic issues. And maybe that's not what's actually underlying uh, the, the current polarized moment. Yes, I see a question from Christine. Yes, thank you so much for fascinating topic and fascinating approach as well. Uh, what I'm missing, remembering a little bit Wayne Cornelius's earlier work on migration uh, is two historical actors. The first one is the employers on the other side of the border. That is their actions, their attitudes, and how they could skip. That was one of the most dramatic stories that Wayne Cornelius conveyed to us at one point. 
is that they were hired on the agrarian sector. And after months of work, they will call in the border police and get them out. So they would not pay the salaries for these workers. So, and I was wondering about the general attitude of employers, no? especially when it comes to success. And the other uh, actor that uh, I'm missing a little bit from uh, your presentation is the remesas, no? that is the money that is a measurement of success, obviously, that gets sent out to sustain the families on the other side of the border. So I was wondering what your reaction is and how that would influence eventually your uh, general conclusions. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, great questions. Um, I don't know anything uh, at the moment about the attitudes um, of employers, and I would love to do something more systematic about it. I mean, from what we understand in the historical record, the agricultural sector and agricultural lobby um, in particular was, was highly involved in trying to keep the border open um, before 1921. Um, and uh, that remains true today. Um, that, in fact, I was just at an immigration conference in D.C. a couple of weeks ago, um, and we were hearing from someone who had been a Republican staffer, um, let's say, 15 years ago, and he asked a friend before the conference, um, uh, what's the number one word that you think of when you think of calls to your office about immigration? And he expected something like, you know, angry, more xenophobic uh, rep, rep, uh, members of the district. Instead, with what this um, staffer said was agricultural lobbyists. That was the number one, you know, in terms of calls to the office on, on immigration issues. Um, so it would be great to have a, a textual source that we could use to try to uh, trace out attitudes of employers over time. Now that we have the model trained on the congressional record, it's possible that we could use smaller text corpuses. I mean, you need a tremendous amount of underlying text to work with some of these large language models, but if people would be willing to accept the idea of transporting the model from one text corpus to another, uh, maybe we could find something um, that would allow us to get at that. Uh, Christine, I've never um, thought about that question at all before, and it's a really interesting one. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, on the topic of remittances, also something that I really don't know that much about. Um, the one thing I would say um, that's an interesting connection between remittances and um, an, uh, an immigrant um, uh, behavior and outcomes is that if you think about remittances as expanding um, your consumption set, immigrants are not only consuming in the United States. They're also implicitly consuming at home. Uh, by sending remittances. And so if we think about where we choose to live today, we're very focused and concerned on local cost of living. And in particular, one of the major um, attributes uh, that, that leads to variation in local cost of living is housing costs. So if you're in San Francisco versus um, you're uh, somewhere in Kansas, your housing cost is going to be uh, you know, astronomically different. Because immigrants are not um, spending 100% of their budget locally, and they're spending some portion on remittances and some portion abroad, uh, immigrants are actually less sensitive to housing prices uh, than are the U.S. born. So this is work that um, uh, an economics colleague of ours, uh, John Monross, um, has done. And I thought that was really quite insightful. Um, if you think about why is it that we find larger foreign born share in some very expensive cities, um, some portion of that uh, that differential is uh, because of where people are spending their money. Um, and if getting into these very expensive cities, but also productive cities, is helpful in terms of either immigrants' own economic outcomes or their children's outcomes, immigrants are putting themselves today in uh, better locations. And we have found as much as we can with the modern data, the geography still matters in explaining some of that, uh, the ch children of immigrant and children of US born differential. It does not matter as much as it used to, but it still matters somewhat. So I think that's an interesting uh, channel through which remittances matter by sort of limiting the extent to which immigrants are consuming only in the US.
a connected topic would be eventually the uh, return migration, no? that in some periods also happens. No? And we have graduate students who actually live in Tijuana and work for UCSD. So. Yes, we've done work on return migration. And um, the, the headline there is that return migration rates are around the same now as they were in the past. So yet another example of the ways in which um, today's immigrant uh, communities have a lot of, um, of resonances and reflections with immigrants 100 years ago. Um, we've done some work um, historically uh, using the, the Norwegian census. In 1910, Norway added a whole supplement to their census asking about people who had spent time in the U.S. because around a third of, my, of Norway's population moved to the U.S. Many of them stayed, but not all. Um, around a quarter of them went back. Uh, and so in 1910, they asked, um, everyone in Norway, have you spent time in the U.S.? If yes, when did you first move? When did you come back? Where were you living when you were in the U.S.? And what were you doing? So that allows us to, to, to um, take a look at return migrants. And we find that return migrants are highly successful. They actually originated from uh, the, some of the, the lowest earning families. When they came to the U.S., they were not earning very much in U.S. terms, but they were able to save up and they were able to move back to Norway and buy land um, and became highly successful through that pathway. Okay, thank you. So Roger's next. Yes, hi, Leo. Thanks for the terrific uh, presentation. Great to see you again. So uh, I just want to pick on, on something that you just said. I mean, in your, in your presentation talking about the children of the last like of great migration, you place a great deal of emphasis on geography, the fact that migrants went to the great industrial center. That's Roger, sorry, I don't, we can't, Leah, can you hear him? Only partially. I was trying to get as much out of it as I could, but yes, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Why don't you go to Susanna? I'll put on my ear, my ear, my ear book. Maybe that'll help. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Suzanne then, and then back to Roger. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, first, the, the, I, I have the book. I love the book. Um, I do research primarily on Black Caribbean immigrants, and uh, your findings are so interesting. Uh, the gender interactions that we find for Black immigrants are fascinating, and what particularly interested me was that you were able to also give a comparison. You had Nigerian immigrants, and they're doing better uh, if all of you should really pay attention to this. Um, Nigerians are doing better uh, than Caribbeans, uh, but they too show a, a massive gender interaction. So uh, that's just kind of what got me into your book. But my question is a little different or my comment. Uh, so to explain the success of children of immigrants born in the 1980s to fathers in the 25th income percentile, you mentioned that immigrant parents are underperforming in the US labor market. You go on to write that, quote, immigrants of all means have higher aspirations for their children's education, unquote. But you don't elaborate on this. A popular variable now used to explain the upward mobility of the children of immigrants is parents' contextual education. Uh, this term you probably know refers to the relative position of foreign-born parents and the distribution of their parents' homelands. Research indicates that foreign-born parents rank higher in the educational distribution of their homelands than native-born U.S. white parents. Uh, parents' contextual education is not a variable that you incorporate into your analyses of second-generation earnings. So my question is, have you thought about that? Have you thought about whether the strong incomes of uh, immigrant children uh, and the fact that the parents underperform in the US labor market is related to uh, the lack of recognition of their contextual education? Um, and as a further thought uh, in response to uh, Professor Fisher's uh, interesting remarks, uh, how might parental contextual education change as immigration continues over time or even possibly increases over time? That's a great question and it's very much on our mind. However, with the modern data that we have currently, we simply cannot take a look at any micro data at the household level. We All that we got from the IRS is what I showed you. Um, those 
40 dots or so that you saw for the 25th percentile and then another 40 dots for the 75th percentile. We also have some information um, that was grouped at a higher level of aggregation, just are you, your parents foreign born or US born without any information on country of birth. And for that, they were willing to give us um, ventiles of the income distribution. So 5th percent, 10th percent, 15th, etc. Um, but we would love to uh, look at the mechanisms underlying second generation success today. So I was recently um, at Harvard um, and talking about the book uh, and Raj Chetty was in the audience and it's Raj's lab um, at Harvard that produces this data. So Raj actually has the underlying um, micro data and not only that, he has, um, it's the IRS records, but it's linked to census, which is how we know about parental um, country of origin. Because of course you don't write down your country of origin when you're filing your taxes, right? So that is something that comes from a link between IRS and census. The other thing we would get from a link between IRS and census is education. So let's say we took people at the 25th percentile, but we saw that immigrant parents were much higher education level than US born parents who are at the 25th. And that is what we think is probably going on today. Raj came up to me after the talk and assured me, don't worry, even though the data has really been under lock and key, um, in a couple of years, um, we're, we're working on trying to get protocols together that would allow other people to access it. Um, you know, but beyond us, we want other people to be able to pro make pro research proposals and to, to, to study particular questions. So that is absolutely the first thing that we're going to try to propose if we can uh, get, get the data. And I think you're exactly right. I also think it's pretty interesting, you know, when you see um, the Ellis Island period to today, we see very similar charts when it comes to upward mobility of second generation, but that does not mean that the mechanisms are the same. You know, so it was geography in the past, but I have a, a pretty strong suspicion that it's education today. Um, and, and that has, um, you know, certainly it emerges out of um, our reading in sociology, but also from our own very small and kind of convenient sample survey from uh, from uh, the modern period. Our survey was quite simple. We just asked people, tell us about your family's immigration history. And then we gave them like a big text box and they could write in whatever they wanted. Um, and we got around 350 responses and we found um, many cases of um, children who described or now they're adults, but they describe their childhood as one in which their parents were um, working in um, restaurants or in hotels or in, in other sort of low, low paid jobs, um, but had come to the US already with a college degree. Um, and so then eventually were able to transition to somewhat higher paid work, um, but they started out in low paid occupations. Um, so I have a feeling that that's uh, much more what's going on um, in the modern data and not and, and, and not at all what's going on in the historical data, actually. Um, in, in the historical data, we do know from 1940 education level of the kids. And what we can see is actually second generation children of immigrants had lower education levels than similarly raised children of white U.S. born, but yet earned more. And so the advantages that came from their geographic location outweighed the fact that they had around half a year less in education. Roger, do you want to try again? Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> picking up on that. Um, so, I mean, if one thinks about precisely the cohort that you just mentioned, these are on the one hand, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> sorry, people who uh, are disproportionately uh, living in in cities and large metropolitan areas at the high point of uh, uh, of American manufacturing in its urban in incarnation. And so they're benefiting from, I assume that you're, they're benefiting from the high wages associated with, uh, with manufacturing at the times. Um, but this is also the period of the Great Compression. So wages, wage differences are, are, are diminishing. And so I'm wondering how, and of course we're living in a, in the period uh, that's entirely the opposite, a period of high uh, gr growing inequality and a inequality that is accentuated precisely in the places where the immigrants are found, find themselves, whether it's New York, Los Angeles, or where have. So I'm wondering to what, first, to what extent does the great compression 
roughly 1940 to 1970 figure into your analysis? To what extent is the mobility that the children of the great migration, uh, to what extent is that mobility enhanced by the, by the wage compression of the times? And then secondly, how did the very different uh, inequality configuration of today, uh, as well as its, its uh, kind of urban correlate, uh, how is that likely to affect the, the, uh, the immigrants, both of the immigrant second generation, both of the vintage that you've analyzed 19, born 1980, and then more speculatively, the vintage, let's say born in 2000 and, and more recently? Well, in some ways, I think your question also harkens back to one of Claude's first points, um, referencing back to Stanley Lieberson's book, um, A Piece of the Pie, that essentially um, immigrants and second generation immigrants from Europe um, in the early part of the 20th century, in retrospect, had many advantages, structural advantages um, that then contributed to their success. So they came to the US at a time when manufacturing was booming. Um, they were um, able to live in those growing cities and their children, even if um, there may not have been many public high schools in those cities at the time, um, were able to um, transition to work maybe around age 15 or 16 and find um, high paying jobs and eventually union jobs um, when the union movement um, expanded in the 40s. Um, and so we entered into that this project with those ideas in mind and having read the Lieberson book and so on and not expecting Honestly, like our prior going into the project was not necessarily expecting that second generation immigrants would be as successful in moving up the ladder today as second generation immigrants from the past because we recognize this wide set of advantages that immigrants enjoyed. And so we were surprised to see um, what I presented to you today, the, the commonality in the upward mobility. But then interpreting that commonality depends really on getting to Suzanne's question eventually, which hopefully, let's say on a five year time horizon, we'll be able to get to, uh, because we, we can quite clearly see historically that how immigrants got ahead was um, through their, their choice of location, immigrants already re um, re revealed to us that they're willing to leave home um, in sometimes in flight of persecution, but oftentimes in search of economic advantage. Um, and so when they get to the US, um, they're more sensitive to um, differentials in economic opportunity. Um, so they don't go to the US South. Um, the South was only 2% foreign born at the time, um, et cetera. Um, and so we can see that that's the channel of success today. Um, and then we were quite surprised to see that just on the descriptive patterns that the extent of success today is, sorry, did I say the path of success today? I meant path of success in the past. Um, but the extent of success today is very similar to the past and that surprised us and now we really need to understand why. And if the reason is that immigrants that we're calling a 25th percent earner are indeed earning at the 25th percentile, but they have a whole set of other advantages that they're bringing with them you know, that they came from a relatively wealthy home in their own um, sending country environment, that they're bringing with them educational experiences, maybe they completed high school, maybe they went to college, um, that they're then embedded in a community where there's others who are also um, high education, even if they are recent arrivals and they're only earning at the 25th percentile, um, then it's really perhaps you might say not a fair comparison. 25th percentile US born and 25th percentile immigrant household are different. But this will teach us something. This will teach us um, the role in which it, income alone matters because the 25th percentile household indeed was earning at the 25th percentile during, the child's, uh, during childhood for these individuals. And their parents indeed were working in low paying jobs and bringing home um, smaller paychecks. Um, and yet the kids are thriving. And so these other advantages um, are incredibly important perhaps and might outweigh some of those financial hardships. Um, so we, we need to understand the mechanisms, but in, in order to really be able to nail um, how it is that the findings sort of go against like my priors and, and it sounds like your priors, Roger, that somehow we think the European immigrants ha came with um, a wide set of advantages um, and yet immigrants today 
despite not having it, those advantages to hold on to, are, are managing to succeed. Could, could I just follow up if there's no one, no one else? I mean, one, one is, of course, those advantages that you just mentioned almost surely held in the earlier period as well. That is, immigrants would have been selected on unobservables that were probably conducive to success. And among them, which you didn't mention, is a higher level of social capital, which today might in fact entail a, a, a greater disparity with respect to natives at the 25th percentile. But I just want to come back to another aspect of my question, and that is to kind of ask you about the children of the great, uh, of the last wave of great migration, and that's to pose a counterfactual. What if there had been no great compression? What outcome would we likely ha have anticipated? To what extent was the great compression uh, did that uh, contribute to to the convergence that you 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 have found? Well, on on the first question, um, you know, you said surely immigrants in the past were selected on attributes that would contribute to success. Um, well, a little bit yes and a little bit no. Um, there are personal attributes um, of personality and psychology that we cannot measure. You know, willingness to take a risk and so on. And in that sense, you might be right. But on family background, actually, immigrants um, from 100 years ago were negatively selected from European countries. Um, so this is work that Ron and I ha um, have done with Catherine Erickson specifically on the case of Norway. And so you might say, geez, Norway, that's not, you know, we want to learn from more than just that one case. Um, but, but Dylan Connor has done this work for Ireland um, and then a set of other economic historians for Italy as well. And um, what, um, what we are finding collectively is that the Statue of Liberty is right, that immigrants were the, um, the poor, the tired, the huddled masses uh, at the time, um, not only relative to the US born, but relative to their own societies. Um, if your father owned land, if your father had an occupation that was white collar or otherwise high paid, the children in those households were less likely to move. Um, and that's really the opposite today, that immigrants today are coming from wealthier and more educated backgrounds. Um, but on the personal attributes, you're, you're, you're probably right. And that's something that, that's just really hard to get at even today. Um, and what if there had been no great compression? Um, well, just keep in mind that our um, final income measure for the sons and um, historically is 1940, which is before the majority of the Great Compression right. happened. Claire, I want to make sure to get to you too. Uh, well, we have six minutes left and I, I, I did have a, it's a slightly different question, so I'm pivoting a little bit. Um, in a way, I think your book is, um, is, is a pretty optimistic book uh, in terms of the role of data and fact. <laughs> In, uh, in shaping the public, right? It, all we, we just need to look at the, the, the facts that you've unveiled through this, this rich um, data that you've linked together. And maybe we will bust those myths, right? But uh, you know, polarization has increased. Um, political scientists have shown that people are resistant to, social psychologists have shown that people are resistant to information that doesn't agree with their priors. How have people reacted when you've presented this work into the public? How have people reacted to your book um, have you met with a lot of resistance or not? Well, it's a really interesting question. Um, the I am completely with you that um, people are more persuaded by um, individual encounters, face-to-face -face encounters and stories than they are by data and, um, in, you know, charts and diagrams that they see floating around on social media. Um, so um, we're certainly under no illusion that this book is going to, you know, suddenly usher in a new era of compromise. Um, but in terms of um, who has been interested in the book, that has been qu uh, quite surprising to us. We were expecting, well, first of all, we were hoping that someone would be interested, you know, so we, we were hoping we would at least have, have like an audience. But Conditional on having an audience, we, we were expecting it to be kind of a center left um, audience, and we were therefore imagining that we would be kind of preaching to the choir. We have not had any interest at all from center left think tanks whatsoever. Um, so if you're talking about equitable growth, Brookings, um, Center for American Progress, nothing. We have had tremendous interest from the center right. Um, 
So I don't know if that is because of the optimism, actually. Uh, not necessarily optimism about data, but optimism about the idea that America works. I think that that is the, the big rainbow that we have on the front cover and the idea that some kids who are raised at at the 25th percentile with few financial resources are able to make it in the country, you know, but it takes time. It's not the first generation. So it's not like the Pollyanna-ish story, but there is an optimism to it. Um, I think that's very appealing to the center right, actually. And I didn't realize how off-putting it would be actually to the center left. Um, we have not had, as far as I know, you know, any real encounters with um, the Trump right. Um, as far as I know, there was one um, reporter from Breitbart who came to my first event in DC, asked me a very, to my mind, confusing and convoluted question. I actually thought that he was an old lefty. He was asking about like exploitation of black workers and how immigrants were being brought into the country to exploit black workers. And, um, and uh, so I was quite confused to find out that he was a Breitbart reporter, um, but otherwise we've had no interaction at all. So I you know, maybe a few kind of um, like obligatory short reviews uh, from some of those like very anti-immigrant um, groups, but nothing. They haven't really come after us in any way. So I think they're basically ignoring us. Um, and then in terms of different groups, um, members of the public, we've actually been speaking quite a lot to different um, groups of retirees. And um, you know, I would say that these, um, the, the audience there, first of all, they're, first of all, those audiences are really large, like there's a whole set of retirees who really want to learn, and they're also pretty um, politically mixed as well. And I have noticed in sort of speaking, it's not one to one, but it's like one to 100 or something like that, where I'm like physically there and I'm talking uh, to a set of people that I do see that people seem to um, be receptive uh, to new information. And they say, oh, I never thought about it that way. That's a really good point. But it's not really scalable. I mean, I can't go around the country and talk to groups of 100 retirees, you know, in every community. Um, so I, I think it, it, it matters, but it's really like people need a messenger for the new data and the new facts like if they hear it from an individual and like from a place of respect where you know i'm i'm open to entertaining their questions and open to having that dialogue then oftentimes they do seem to change their mind but i don't think that that's something we can do at a broader scale right well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we are coming to the end of our allotted time, uh, sadly. Uh, but thank you so much uh, to Leah and thank you to Claude for, for your time. Uh, this was a fascinating talk. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for being here. Thank you so much, everyone. I really enjoyed it and, and really useful comments for, for our next steps of, in our work. So have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.